So we called on council to declare a climate emergency. Now what? Here's our gathering in the park where everybody was writing letters. We had climate strikes and um, everybody was really mobilised, as you all know, by what happened last year um, here. So moving on, what should we do? Well, the first thing we have been doing is continuing to build on what has gone before. Ian said, I've done a lot of work. Lots of people have done a lot of work. And it's really great having that happening because um, just th there's so many things that can be done and it's really valuable to have people working on and focusing in, in different areas. And also what has gone before has fed into the position that we're in now. All the work that people have already done on what we need to do to um, move towards a safe climate. And uh, I was able to draw on that and we as a group, the climate action group, the, uh, the other working groups, the people who worked on the report. So it's a real collaborative uh, effort of the community engaging with council and that's what really what needs to happen. And I think that's a really exciting part of this. So as well as building on what's happened before, we need to stay conscious of the future we face if we do not act. And it's difficult to do that. And, and it's not good for us to, con to continue to focus on that. We need to focus on the future and what we can do. But unless we remember the severity, we don't, it's just really easy to slip into the busyness of what needs to be done now and forget that there is still a climate emergency. Um, so, hold in there, persist. We, uh, we've come so far and we can continue to make changes. So um, as a result of the community action, the community call, the science, what was happening around us, in October 2019, Arb Armadale Regional Council unanimously declared a climate emergency. And I think that was a great thing that our council did at that time. I'm really appreciative of the effort that went into uh, that happening, that, that, that councillors put into getting that to happen and getting the wording right, getting things a, a way for us to move forward on this. So then on Christmas Eve 2019, we were given a reprieve. <laughs> it rained and things are reversed and that anxiety and worry about all of the bushfires and the drought and things started to be lifted from us and we've been given sort of an, an opportunity to move forward without those emergency stresses um, immediately threatening. How have council and community responded to the climate emergency? Well, there is a need to mobilise and take action at a scale and speed that will restore a safe climate. And that's globally, but what can we do locally? Council, as part of the climate emergency declaration, called, uh, asked for a report on what has been done and what could be done for council uh, to reduce, reduce greenhouse gas emissions heading to zero emissions by um, 2030, which is what the aim for Project Zero Thirty collaboration with the uni is, UNE, to draw down carbon and to adapt to changes already underway or anticipated. There are other things, but those are the things that we have been focusing on. The climate emergency working group was set up um, eventually uh, as, as part of council's environmentally, uh, sorry, Environmental Sustainability Advisory Committee and tasked with preparing a report and persisted through holdups and challenges. But we've now come to a, port, a, a, a place where we feel that that's m moving ahead in a really positive way. Um, the people on that um, advisory, on that working group, um, produced a report which is a framework for climate action. Also earlier on we also produced a, um, 
a shorter priority list, just identifying the areas of that we thought were priority for action so that something could be included in the budget and that has been done. I'll come to that shortly. So in that report, we've got part one, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, part of that is actually in how council goes about its planning and strategy. So we've got recommendations about that. We've got recommendations for specific reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and that's in the area of reducing energy, electricity emissions, reducing transport emissions, reducing waste emissions, reducing emissions from agriculture and from food. You're all familiar with those. Well, everyone who's, uh, I, I, I dare say that most of you are, because that's what SLA has been working on since, it's, since it's, it was set up. Um, part two of the report is drawdown of atmospheric carbon. Why do we need to draw down carbon? Because um, while we might reduce emissions, there's already a, plenty of carbon up in, up in the atmosphere which will continue to cause global warming. So we also need to find ways of drawing that down. For the purposes of this report, we've focused mainly on tree planting um, and also touched on regenerative agriculture, which council doesn't have so much of a role in, but which the 030 project is including in its um, framework. Part three, identify the risks and adapt. And I've just put one example of how we might adapt um, up and a, a photo of what it looked last year. 2019 when the drought was so severe and there was no feed on the ground and no water in the dams. So part one, reduce some energy emissions. Uh, we need to go back to energy audits of houses and energy efficiency. So in the report, we talk about what council can do in its own operations, how it might be able to support the community to make these changes, the community, including residents, businesses, and institutions. So when I talk about any of these changes, um, we're looking at how council can work in its own area, but also support the community to make the changes that are needed as well. Um, you can see there the example of insulating your house, or putting um, bubble wrap in the windows also for insulation. So reduce energy emissions, produce renewable energy. Um, the energy group in SLA has worked for a long time on trying to get changes happening. I saw Adam Blake's was there. He's done a huge amount of work in collaboration with a lot of other people towards renewable energy. And uh, you can see here the panels that council already has put up on the information center. Um, they've recently given us feedback as to panels that have gone up in other buildings and we're talking about how that might be expanded. For example, uh, there's currently a plan to put renewable, to put um, PVs on the uh, sale yards and there's also, um, Mahala's been encouraging council to work on the new build, the renovation of the old library where the business hub will be. Um, so those are a couple of possi possibilities. Um, reduce transport emissions. We've had um, the transport group in SLA working this for, in, this for a long time. Dorothy Robinson's had a particular focus on improving um, transport bicycles, bicycle routes. We all saw how nice and quiet and safe it felt on the roads when the coronavirus restrictions were on and some people in some some um, communities actually retained bicycle lanes so have uh, talking to council about how we can make that more safe moving forward with bicycle strategy things that can be done there as well council is actually uh, moving towards starting to electrify its vehicles it's, it's fleet. This is a picture of um, 
in putting in a, a electric vehicle charging stations in Newcastle. There are some already in um, Armidale, but, but we're talking to them about could there be more put in, how might they encourage them to be put in in other areas so that, to help them move forwards to electric vehicles. Just a little aside on vehicles and the importance of our individual choice in the vehicles that we purchase. I just saw this article in The Guardian a couple of days ago. The International Energy Agency found that SUVs were the second largest cause of the global rise in carbon dioxide emissions over the past decade, eclipsing all shipping, aviation, heavy industry and even trucks. Uh, they have the weight of an adult rhinoceros and the aerodynamics of a refrigerator and emit more so CO2 than the small cars overshadowing car industries, climate gains from fuel efficiency improvements in the electric vehicle market. I was astounded, but that's pretty interesting. Individual choice is important. So council is really has has been at the forefront in some of its recycling initiatives. Many of the, uh, the councils that have called, uh, have declared a climate emergency um, are looking to set up a, uh, a use of organic waste and council's already doing that. We've already got quite a good recycling um, system and that can be improved on um, and people can be reminded of what's needed to be done to make that more efficient. Um, council is extending its city to soil organic waste recovery to Gyra. So expanding that food waste to um, other parts of our local government area and um, also within to, biz, to businesses, so restaurants, UNE has been doing a lot of work on in this area. Reduce agriculture emissions. Uh, we haven't focused on that because agricultural emissions, uh, council doesn't have a strong role there, but the 030 project has certainly uh, taken that in consideration and uh, partnering with UNE research to work towards reducing emissions from agriculture. Reducing food emissions, um, I guess most of us are pretty familiar with what's already been underway here with our community garden. So it's really important to buy local food, support farmers markets, grow your own or support the community garden. Um, look at what you're buying in the supermarket, look at how it might contribute to waste and the choices that we make there can be really important. It's an estimate that maybe 25% of our emissions are related to food growing, distribution, refrigeration, storing, waste, etc, etc. So it is a really important area. Um, and I think that if we're looking at an education, uh, we are encouraging council to partner with the community for, for more education relating to how we can reduce emissions. This is certainly one area that's a bit on hold while coronavirus is um, particularly um, a problem, but hopefully we can move <coughs> towards that a bit later. <clears throat> Part two of the report, carbon storage and drawdown of atmospheric carbon. Our main focus here has been on tree planting in the short term because if something that's already underway, it's something where there's already been a lot done through Armidale Tree Group, who's been working on this area of re, um, restoring the tree cover since, I can't remember when, but let's say the 80s, 70s, I'm not sure. And um, um, Southern New England Land Care, the Land Care Movement, Armidale Urban River Care, which has done so much work along um, the creek line. And, and so that's something that will work to, to draw down carbon, to store carbon. It's something that we can engage the community in, that the community is really supportive 
of and that there's already lots of things happening which will help to enable that and it has the advantage of the potential to improve our riparian areas which might be really important and which are really important in the light of possible future prolonged droughts and things like that and also helping with connectivity and refuge for flora and fauna. Part three, identify the risks. Um, climate change impacts in many ways, in many areas. Um, you kind of hear the list of what's going to, what's predicted to change in our area, which is, um, you know, uh, more intense weather events, prolonged heat waves, prolonged more intense drought, um, storms and flooding, flooding, bushfires. <clears throat> and in, those things in turn affect many aspects of our community, which might be the natural environment and landscape. Our water supply, crucial biodiversity, our ability to produce food. We all saw last year in 2019 that the farm dams were dry, the farmers had to sell off a lot of their um, grazing animals, they had run out of water, um, they were feeding their stock, buying in water. Um, it, that become, becomes unsustainable. So what are our risks? And this is something where we didn't really have the answers, uh, but we need to work together as a community to develop what those answers will be. Last year, we got to hand it to the councillors who um, who um, make, were happy to make themselves look a bit foolish in order to move forward with their very successful uh, education program that helped reduce the water usage in Armadale from 240 to what is it? 240 litres per day per person to 100. 60 litres per day per person. If council can move ahead with that sort of education program on what people can do to reduce emissions, to, um, to uh, help with climate change, that would be a really good way to go in order to get appropriate action happening in our area. Uh, we saw also that um, that council put in uh, quite a bit of money to do a whole lot, put, put a lot of bores in to see whether there was availability of water. So council is doing its job in the sense of um, trying to find water sources that will help in the case of drought. But we've got this controversy, which is it's really, really important that we don't deplete the aquifers that have been there for thousands of years by saying, oh, here's another water source, we can just use it. So that's something which really we need to pay attention to and um, work uh, tr try to work with uh, the hydrologists and hydrogeologists and the regulator to ensure that that looking to the future of water doesn't cause the water depletion of the remaining water that we have. Protection against biodiversity loss. Um, biodiversity loss is, uh, we saw the impact on flora and fauna um, relating to the bushfires last year. Um, Armadale has been found to have actually quite a healthy population of koalas. This may be a refuge area for the future and um, there has actually been funding obtained by council for a koala project officer to work out of the Southern New England Land Care Office. Um, if we're focusing on uh, revegetation, then that can be helpful in terms of creating and enhancing vegetation links between remnant vegetation, focusing on riparian vegetation. So we're fitting in with tree planting and carbon sequestration and hopefully helping to protect against biodiversity loss as well. So council has allocated $60,000 in the current budget to get started. Um, 
what are the priorities and you're welcome to feed back into these or particularly if you have a look at the climate emergency framework action um, to sort of if you if you feel strongly about particular pro priorities that are identified uh, some of us have been meeting with council staff to discuss what's in the framework council of um, our council's environmental officer Mandy McLeod has given us good feedback on where council is currently up to with its um, putting in solar panels uh, energy efficiency um, and other other things so that's a really really sorry that's a real step in the right direction as well so the way forward where to from here we need to persevere keep um, you know everybody keep working together I just feel like the energy is really gathered in a positive way and there are a lot of good things coming out of that we need to continue to work on reducing our own individual emissions or um, increasing efficiencies in our water usage um, transport etc um, if you get if you can read the report a framework for climate action that will be made available I'm not quite sure exactly how yet but we will let you know become informed re council responsibilities and planning framework for example the community strategic plan and eco arc this has been a huge learning curve for me and I've got to take off to my hat to the councillors who've been working on this for years to, to uh, understand it themselves and also try to get us to interact and take notice of what's happening and um, have our say about it because uh, there are plenty of people who, well, there's a selected group of people who do have their say. It's really important that um, the voice of climate action is within that because if it's not, it doesn't get heard. So watching or attending monthly ordinary council meetings, reading the business papers, having a look at what's going on, uh, like Maria did last, uh, last week or the week before, have your say, make it known what, what the community is thinking about things, engage in public consultation processes, uh, but the Creeklands Master Plan, the Local Strategic Planning Statement and the upcoming, coming, sorry, the first two are already on display at Council and they're asking for our feedback and the Drought Management Strategy, we're told, will also be put on display for public comment. That Local Strategic Planning Statement could be really important. Um, I've been looking at some of the others. Uh, it's possible to identify climate change and mitigation and um, what's the other thing uh, zero biodiversity loss for example as priorities in that planning framework and that planning framework is going to feed into what council does that's really important so if you do get a chance to look at that collaborate with each other on what uh, we would like how we would like to see that draft change and continue to work with council towards positive outcomes. Where to from here, support positive government initiatives such as the New England Renewable Energy Zone. Continue to put pressure on government where its policies and actions do not align with climate emergency action. For example, the gas-led economic recovery from coronavirus that's currently being proposed support our young people and their hope for the future. So part of that could be to support the School Strike for Climate, Global Day of Climate Action, which is coming up on September the 25th, and celebrate our achievements. 